I want to talk today about my experiences during what historians know as the uh, Armero tragedy, which was the eruption um, of the stratovolcano in Armero, which is um, a town in the Tolima department in Colombia. Um, I was in U.S. Special Forces at the time, and I had been stationed. Uh, our base was actually at Fort Davis, uh, Panama. Back then, it was the Panama Canal Zone. In Special Forces, I mainly worked on my own, and I would be detached to work on problems. I was kind of like a communications fixer. Uh, Re-establishing communications for units that worked along, especially the, the um, Honduran-Nicaraguan border, uh, but other parts of Central America and Latin America. So one late evening, um, as if I re recall correctly, I was already actually asleep, and I just returned from a deployment. So this man banged on my door, and uh, he said, "Ortiz, you've really, uh, <laughs> you've really done it now." Now in Central America, in the military in general, um, um, I did periodically get into trouble. I remember that uh, one of the officers, uh, one time, I was being awarded. Uh, a citation, and the comment that the officer made was, well, Ortiz, um, you got a medal for this, uh, but you came one step away from getting a court-martial. And so when I got the knock and was told that um, a general from Southern Command wanted to talk with me, um, I thought I was in big trouble. And I got on the phone, and the voice on the other side said, uh, is this Sergeant Ortiz? And I said, um, uh, yes, sir, who's calling me? And again, if memory is correct, it was, um, it was perhaps maybe the executive commander of Southern Command. I don't remember. I just remember it was a general. And this was the first time in my life I'd ever spoken to a general on a telephone or in person, uh, period. And uh, he started referring to me um, as son. He said, well, son, do you know that we have lost a... Um, uh, a combat aviation battalion uh, somewhere in Colombia. Do you, do you know what that means? And I thought about it for a moment, and I said, well, uh, no, sir, but I, I, it sounds pretty serious. And he said, we've, we've completely lost communication with them. We know roughly where they're at. Uh, they're on the side of a mountain. And, um, but we need to reestablish communications with them ASAP. Can you do that? And he prefaces this by saying that I had a reputation as being one of the best operators, radio operators in the region. And I said, uh, well, yes, sir, I think I think I can do that, but I need a, I'm gonna need a team of men to do it. I can't do it by myself. We're gonna have to build antennas. We're gonna have to set up a whole communication site. It's quite a bit of work. One person cannot do it. He said, fine, take as many men as you need um, and report to the Southcom uh, headquarters. And I said, well, sir, I'll get a team together and uh, we'll meet you there first thing in the morning. Um, and he said, son, we already have a helicopter waiting for you. And uh, they, in fact, picked us up in a helicopter and choppered us over to Panama City from Fort Davis. At that time, the headquarters of Southcom was in Panama City. And what we had done in Central America as radio operators and special forces is we had to work on our own quite a bit you had to be very nimble, you had to be creative, you had to come up with solutions for problems that were not in any book. And so um, I got the team together, um, we got on the chopper, we choppered into Southcom. As best as I can remember, remember, this was a room where we met all of these high-ranking officers, and it was four of us, three of us were, non, uh, were NCOs, and then one person was a PFC. Everyone else in the room was a major colonel general. Uh, and, you know, I was like, wow. And the first question I received was um, a question about if you were in an environment where there was a lot of ash and particles blocking line of sight between the ground and the sun, 
would that impact radio communication? Um, and I said, well, yes, sir, it would. Uh, well, what, what would happen if this debris was partially radioactive? Um, and so I thought about it for a moment. I said, well, th this, would, this would be the situation. If this, if this debris was actually radioactive, this is what you'd have to do, et cetera, et cetera. And it occurred to me at a certain point, I started thinking, have these guys started a nuclear war? You know, are they asking me to reestablish communications to some place that's been bombed by an atomic bomb or something? So I finally asked, I said, you know, with all due respect, can I ask what happened? Why this aviation battalion of helicopters, state-of-the-art equipment has lost communication to Southcom? And by that point, I realized, I knew they were in somewhere in Colombia. I had been in Bogota. I'd never been to where I was eventually going to go. That's the point they told me about the volcanic eruption. And what they told me was that a volcano had just erupted and it had killed thousands of people in a town called Armero, which I never, I never heard of before. And then it was revealed to me that the aviation battalion had been sent very soon after the eruption to start a disaster relief mission. And that was part of the gravity of the whole situation is they're trying, they're still trying to save people. And they had completely lost communication with this outfit, which was supposed to be bringing food and blankets and, and Red Cross types of equipment, uh, material into Armero. The town had been wiped out. So um, I said, well, um, sir, I think we can do it. I think we can reestablish communication. In fact, I'm sure we can, but I'm gonna need this, 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 and this. And I started basically telling them what I needed. And I said, I need a pallet of lithium batteries. Uh, I need a whole range of different types of radios. I need a UHF, I need a HF, I need a satellite radio. I need every band you can, you know, basically, I was asking for the moon. At a certain point, I think it was a colonel looked at me in this round table. But uh, this colonel looks at me and he says, um, uh, you can't ask for any of that, for, for all that equipment. Do you know how much, you know how expensive that is? And this general who was really leading the discussion cut this man off and he said, Colonel, <laughs> he basically told him to stand down. I don't remember exactly what he said, but basically he said, let, let the man talk. He is in charge here. That's basically what he said. So I was like, voila, there we go. And so I basically asked for as much radio material as I could. I assumed that there was no uh, power uh, in this in this place, and so that's why I asked for so many batteries. A lithium battery looks back then it looks like a big like well literally like a big red brick. So we got to this abandoned, uh, as far as I can remember, it was an air force uh, or abandoned air base. So we got there, and in fact, there was no power. There was no fixed power that I remember. Um, so we set up our radios. Um, at, at a certain point, the base came under fire, taking some kind of small arms fire. And we got communication set up, and, and very quickly the gravity of the situation just bore in on us, which was that we had to reestablish communication to, um, to really get this, this disaster relief mission, at least the part that the, that the U.S. was involved in, the military, going again. And so, as best as I can remember, um, there were big airplanes, there would have been C-130s coming in with supplies and equipment and stuff for the relief mission. Um, so we got the communication going. Uh, we set up, as best as I remember, we set up a high frequency radio, which meant we strung a very long antenna. Um, as, again, memory, this is memory, this it could be tricky. I think what had happened was that they had sent this aviation battalion out with only a VHF radio, which is essentially more or less, um, um, we, we called it back then, uh, kind of vehicle to vehicle uh, communication. Really good for helicopters to communicate to each other, but doesn't, VHF doesn't have the range you need to get from you know, Tolima to Panama City. I had been ready for that because as a radio operator, 
as the son of a radio operator, growing up with stories about how the military often badly misplayed communications, and how if you look into military history, a lot of reasons that battles are lost have to do with communications. Reestablishing them, we were treated like heroes. So we got the communications going again within a few hours. Um, the, the unit was very grateful for us. For one, they were able to talk to the home base, to Panama City, which was a big relief to them. And especially when they're in territory. In Colombia back then, um, anytime you went in, in any part of the country like that, you were essentially in a combat zone. You have to understand we're processing, you know, I don't know how many messages per minute, constantly coming back and forth, back and forth. Supplies, blankets, food, all sorts of things. It's a really stressful environment. And it became clear that we had to maintain a 24 seven radio operation. It meant you don't go to sleep. On the one hand, it was exhilarating to be in the middle of so much activity, knowing you were doing something that actually was a good thing. Because by that time I realized, I was beginning to realize that the US presence in Central America was not a good thing, uh, the military presence. But I realized, or I think all four of us realized that, that this was a different kind of mission. We weren't training people how to shoot each other. We weren't shooting anyone. We weren't being shot at by and large, uh, but we were actually doing something that was meaningful. And I would hear tidbits of stories on the radio from pilots who were choppering in or, or uh, into Armero. The town had been destroyed completely by a massive mud flow that, that rocketed down the, the volcano. And in fact, within just a, a maybe 10 minutes or, or, or less, or maybe a little more, uh, some 25,000 people were killed. And it was one of the worst volcanic disasters in human history. Uh, I think it was the second worst in the 20th century. And again, we had no idea uh, before the fact. Um, but being there a week, um, we heard a lot of stories about what the pilots were finding, just a lot of the tragedies. Um, at one point, um, one of the, the pilots came in, I think on more than one occasion, and offered to you know take us down to to the town and to actually see where the mud flows had buried the town etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i can't remember if any of my guys went i didn't go i don't know if it was my imagination but i could almost feel the tragedy and the spirits of people who've been killed so horrifically on the other side completely on the other side of this volcano and mountain it just, it, it felt so heavy and so grievous. You know, for years, I would have nightmares of being there. The minute I was told that we were off duty and we had transitioned and set up a communications plan for them so they could stay in communication with, with Panama City so that we could leave, um, I, I remember looking at a pallet that once had had lithium batteries and just collapsing. And uh, a couple of the guys said afterwards they thought I'd had a stroke. Uh, they loaded me on a helicopter and I woke up in Panama City. We choppered all the way from Tulema back to Panama. And we never really heard much after that. I remember getting some citations. Um, my team received the Humanitarian Service Medal, um, other, other accommodations. The, the work that we did that week in Tulema, um, I am very proud of. And I think that there was a redemptive, there was a kind of a redemptive nature to that work. Um, I can't really make up for what my country did in Central America. We did just terrible things. And when I came back, it was astonishing to me to talk to friends um, and they would say, well, Paul, you know, why are so many Hondurans or Colombians or Salvadorans or Nicaraguans uh, in Los Angeles or Seattle or Sacramento? And I would say, you don't know why? You don't know what our government is doing to make this whole region uninhabitable to its own residents? And these people are having to flee and leave their own countries to come to the United States or to Mexico or Argentina or other places. 
And so the whole, the, the corruption, the scandals, the arms for hostages, the underhand of the dirty tricks, um, all of those things, the support for Contras. Um, I knew some people were in the Contras. Um, these were bad people. And so that was the kind of thing that I was involved in in the region. So the Armero experience was completely different. If, if you ask me how to kind of sum it up, I'd say you have four very young men, probably the oldest is maybe 22, and we were essentially um, told to fix a problem that other people created. We have a combat aviation battalion that's lost communications with, you got to reestablish communications, can you do it? And to me, um, it's, it's really the greatest thing I did in the military. We're coming up on, on November, you know, November 13th, and so every time of this year, uh, that, that's when the volcano erupted. Um, you know, I, I kind of have that feeling. I know November is the month that the volcano erupted. There's something that, that either I left behind there or that I took with me that I'll always have with me.